بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم إن نسألك حبك وحب من يحبك وحب عمل يقربنا إلى حبك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين يا رب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تعالى يا أيها النبي إن أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا وبشر المؤمنين بأن لهم من الله فضلا كبيرا um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for our first session of this new series in his footsteps sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and um, this series is all about us getting to know the Habibullah much more closer and much more intimately. This Halakha series is about studying the Prophet Sallallahu in a deep way so that you know him personally, so that you feel that he is your Prophet and you are connected to him. And Ibn Qayyim al Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala, we've studied his books before, and he says something about your connection with prophets and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, uh, La sabila ila sa'ada wal falah. There is no way for us to be successful. La fid dunya and la fil akhirah. Not in this world or in the akhirah. Illa ala aydir rusul. Except that we sit at the feet of the anbiya. We learn from the anbiya. Wa la sabila ila ma'rifat al-tayyib wal khabith. And he says, there's no way to, to know what is good in the sight of God and what is displeasing to the sight of God except by learning from them. And he says these powerful words. He says, فَهُمَ الْمِيزَانَ الرَّاجِحِ They are the scales by which you judge if something is right or wrong, if something is good or not, if this is how I should carry myself or not. He says, they are the scales. الَّذِي عَلَىٰ أَقْوَالِهِمْ وَأَعْمَالِهِمْ we measure our actions, we measure our speech, we measure all that we do compared to the Anbiya. How did they live? How did they live? Now, this session, I wanted to start off this session. I wanted to start off this session with moments from the early life of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. But we can't do that tonight. And the reason we can't do that tonight is that last Friday, we lost a beloved brother of ours, Hadi Diwan. And for, for us, this is, this, is, this is different. Because every single Wednesday, Hadi was with us sitting in this majlis. Hadi was in this gathering. And how many times in this gathering, just in last week, we literally said, don't be afraid to do Toba because you don't know if you're going to be here next week. And so tonight's halakha is about looking at our beloved Habib Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's what this series is about. It's about studying his life and realizing that you need a deep connection with the anbiya. You need that connection, that light in your life. And I'm going to go deeper into this, but I specifically want to look at one aspect in light of us losing our beloved brother Hadi. I want to look at how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with pain and suffering and loss. I want to study how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with losing close people to him. See, the idea, brothers and sisters, is there's a million ways to respond to the joys of life. There's a million ways to respond to the hardships of life. There's a million ways, but there's one approved way. And there's one way that's tried and tested, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already put the stamp of approval on it, and that's the way Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded. There's a hadith I want to begin with. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
He said, لا يؤمن أحدكم It's a well-known hadith, but we have to start with it. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين This is the beginning hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, none of you is a true believer. You're not a true believer until this. Until you love the Habib of Allah. Until you love the Prophet of God. More than you love your own parents. I heard one scholar, he said, is the reason is because your parents give you life into this world. But the Prophet, he gives you the key to life in the next world. He's the, he's, he's the father, so to speak, of your spiritual life. Where would you be without that? More than you love, you, you love the prophet more than you love your, your own parents, more than you love your own children, more than you love all humanity. Umar ibn Khattab, one day he came up to the prophet, he heard this hadith, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everything, everything other than myself. He was keeping it real. He's like, I love you more than everything, but not more than my, myself. And the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, not yet, Umar. Like, you haven't made it yet. You could get better. And the narration says that Umar ibn Khattab in that moment, he bowed his head down. He looked down and he was in thought for, for a minute or two. And then he looked up and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than myself. The thing is, it's yourself that will trip you up on this path to righteousness. It's your desires. It's your inability to control that self that trips you up. It's the thing that gets in the way. So then when he said, I love you more than myself now, Ya Rasulullah, the Prophet looked at him, he said, Al-an, Ya Umar. Now, O oh Umar, you've made it. Now you have made it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran, Surah Al-Ahzab, verses number 45 to 47, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, O Prophet of God, Indeed, we have sent you shahidan as a witness. We're all witnesses. We're all witnesses. In fact, as we remember Hadi, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there was a person who passed away, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sitting around as they were remembering this brother who passed away, and they were talking about the good that he did. And when the Prophet Sallallahu heard that, he looked at them and he said, Wajabat. Wajabat. All right. Wajabat means it's, it's mandatory. It's mandatory. And then there was another person that passed away. And the Sahaba were like, yeah, man, I ain't never see him. No. No. Whatever. Like they were keeping it real. Like homie didn't pull up. He wasn't around. We weren't together. Whatever they said. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Wajabat. Again, he said the same thing. He said, it's compulsory. And finally, they're like, Ya Rasulullah, what? what? We don't get when we spoke positive about this person who passed away, you said compulsory. What were you talking? The Prophet Sallallahu said, you are the witnesses of God on this earth. You believing people, you righteous people, you people who are connected to Allah, you are, you are God's witness on earth. When you spoke good of him, Jannah became compulsory on him. How many of us, after Hadi passed away, all we can remember was good? And I remind us all, what's your legacy? Last week, I said, we said, don't let long life, the thought that I'm living forever, stop you from doing Toba right now. You don't know where you'll be next week. And on Friday, when Eamon sent me the message, I texted Akram, and I was like, yo, y'all got it mixed up. I was like, yo, I couldn't believe because we were all just together right now. I want you to look to your right, look to your left, just for a moment. Look at the brothers and sisters you're sharing space with. You could look. <laughs> like now? Yes, now. Because these are the people that will bear witness for you to the righteousness that you did. I gotta go into this more, I'm sorry. Hadi was with us every Wednesday, and here we are again on a Wednesday, together, learning. And Hadi's like, I'm out, y'all, I'm going. 
My heart needs Jannah. Allah is like, his time is time to go. My man was too good for these gatherings. He needed the other gathering. His father said that Hadi came to him with a dilemma. Now, what would you think a 21-year-old's dilemma was? 22, 23. How old is Hadi? 21. 21. What would you think at the age of 21, what are most people's dilemma? Do you know what his dilemma was? Sheikh Yasser Qadi has a halakha on Tuesday night and Mufti Kamani has a, I can't hit both up. I can't hit both of them up. What am I going to do? I remind you of a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said on the day of judgment, the sun will be very close above us and it will be very hot. On the day of judgment, it will be extremely hot as the sun is brought close to all the creation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said people will be sweating profusely. People will be sweating, sweating, sweating profusely. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, but there will be seven people who will be under the shade of Allah's throne. Do you know what one of them is? A young man or a woman who spent their time just worshiping God. Going to halakhas, learning, sitting in gatherings, reading Quran, sitting in good gatherings, being around the goodness. I called a close friend of mine and I told him, he doesn't know Hadi. And the moment I told him, he said, how old? I said, 21. He said, Saba'a. He said, seven, seven, he's one of seven. So as we sit here, a room of young people, all of us in our minds thinking, it's not my time yet. Just last week, somebody was in this gathering right here. What was the last thing he did before he passed away? Salat to Juma with the brothers. Salat al Jummah with the brothers. They all pulled up to Jummah at Mass, Sah. Mass, Sah. Saw each other, got the khutbah, cleaned his sins off. Clean, clean as a baby. The hadith says, Jummah to Jummah, sins clean. Came out clean on the Jummah before Maghrib. Jummah, he's with Allah. Brothers and sisters, we don't know. We don't know if next week we're talking about you or me. Let this be an ibarah for us. Let this be a lesson for us to reflect upon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about our, our beloved Prophet, why do we need to connect to the Anbiya? Why are we studying the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I'll tell you why. In the days of Mecca, in the days of Mecca, we were being persecuted. We were being persecuted. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bringing this message he was offered everything to stop giving this message, but he said, I can't. This isn't from me. This is from God. I have a responsibility. But as a result of that message, people very close to him were being persecuted. So finally, the Prophet wasallam, he says to the Sahaba, um, it's time to go somewhere else. It's time to go somewhere else. And he tells them to migrate to Abyssinia, Africa. Africa. So the Sahaba go to Abyssinia. And when the Sahaba go to Ab Abyssinia, a group of them, the Quraysh are like, no, we can't let you just chill like that. We can't see you happy. We can't see you happy. That can't happen. So they went after them. And when they went after them, I want to read to you, subhanAllah, I want to read to you the words that Jafar radiallahu ta'ala an, because when I was thinking about how we could understand how we need the Anbiya, the only thing that could come to my mind was these words of, of, of Jafar radiallahu ta'ala an. Jafar, Najashi calls him in. There were two men from the Quraysh who were sent to um, bring all these Muslims back to Mecca. So they did what any person in politics does. They brought a lot of money in bribery. 
you know, lobbying. Call it what you want. And they said to Najashi, you know, these, these guys have fled our, our city. They're really rough people. They're bad people. Please send them back so we can take care of them. Najashi was a righteous man. The Prophet had already said he was a righteous man. وسلم, he said he's a person of justice. He said, no, I'm not going to send them back without listening to them first. So he calls Jaffa. And because Jaffa is so close to the Prophet وسلم, the Sahaba, there's a group of them, they all push him up. <laughs> You're in front of the king. You have to represent us. And he speaks in the most eloquent language and he says something I want everyone to think about. I want us to understand. I want you to walk away tonight knowing that you need the Prophet You need his teachings in your life. Without them, you're in darkness. Now, some of us were in that darkness before and we saw the darkest of darkest nights and we saw the brightest of brightest days. And because of that, we never ever want to go back. That's why Ibn Qayyim al Jozi he says something. I want you to write this down. This is deep. Ibn Qayyim al Jozi he says, the only person who knows the reality of anything is someone that was in it and outside of it. At this, uh, in it and outside of it. When they were in it, they saw a reality. When they were outside, they saw the reality. So they saw, see the whole thing. They see the whole thing. I want you to walk away from tonight understanding that, that the Prophet وسلم, is a light for you. I'm going to finish this verse and then I'm going to come back to Jaffa. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nabi, we sent you as a witness. A witness. How will people, how did they respond to you? Did they follow your sunnah? Did they get close to you? You're a witness on the day of judgment. Wa bashiran, and you're a giver of glad tidings. The Prophet Sallallahu teachings gave hadi glad tidings. Wa nadira, and he's a warner. He warns us from running away. In one hadith which touches my heart every time I read it, the Prophet ﷺ says, I am holding you by the back of your, 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 your jubba, your thobe, your, your, your abaya. I'm holding you, but you're slipping out of my hands because you keep following your nafs. You're slipping out of my hands. Wada'iyan, Allah says in this verse, and he sent you as a caller to God, bi'idnihi, and he sent you as a bright Shining lamp. You know, you need a lamp when it's dark out in order to see where you're going. And without the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, without the Quran, without these teachings, it's darkness. Imam Razi, he says, why does God say a lamp and not the sun? He says the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though the sun is brighter, he says because a lamp, a lamp you could take another light next to it and, and, and make that one shine and pass that light on, y'all. That light just keeps passing from one lamp to the next lamp to the next lamp to the next lamp. That light passes on. So Jafar radiallahu anh is sitting in front of this superpower, the, the king of Abyssinia. And he says, these guys say you're bad people and you need to be sent back. And he says, let me explain to you what happened. He starts off this way, and this is where I, we all need to start. He starts off by saying, oh king, we were an ignorant people. He didn't start where we were very educated, we were well off, we were good to go. We were actually pretty good in Mecca. Life was, I was chilling. La. He goes, we were ignorant. We were lost. He says, we did indecent things. He said, the weak consumed, were consumed by the, by the powerful. We ate anything. He says, we didn't care about the neighbors. We didn't care about anything except getting ahead in life. That's it. And look what he says next. He says, until Allah sent us, a messenger who we knew. He sent us someone to guide us. And that guide told us to worship Allah alone, to respect the neighbor, to join the family ties. And he mentions all of these things, all of these things, all of these things. What I want you to focus on is where does Jaffer start? He starts by saying, I knew nothing before I met Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's me and you. 
And the only thing I can tell you, if you've never been outside of that, and may you, Allah protect you from it, the only thing I can tell you is look at the world around you. And look at the protection and the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Indeed, in the Prophet of God, there is a beautiful example for you. In every aspect of our lives, in everything that we're doing, if we study him, if we know him, I'm telling you, in, in the smallest moment, you'll see him as an example. I'll give you an example. So, like three days ago, I was in my feelings. Is that what y'all say? Yeah. <laughs> I was in my feelings. I wasn't having a really good day, okay? And I was coming down the rotunda, right? It's coming down the rotunda, right over there, right? And um, my mind is all on this, this sunnah right now. I'm like, the mind is just on the Prophet Sallallahu And I remembered in that moment, I was in my feelings, as y'all say, whatever. I don't even know what that means, but whatever. Like, I wasn't in the right place. I wasn't. And then I remembered something. Y'all know what I remembered? I remembered that anytime someone saw him, he was smiling. And right there in that moment, I was coming down the stairs. Before I took the next step, I just smiled. Now, now listen, I'm not going to tell you that's going to change your life. I'm not going to tell you that's going to gain Jannah for you. But that small sunnah of the Prophet changed the rest of my day. Change, that one thing of me knowing, I just knew in my head, I said, he was always smiling. And so I was like, fake it till you make it. <laughs> fake it till you make it. I put a smile. And well, lost, something lit up inside of me. Something lit up because I knew I was re being rewarded for following the sunnah, even in a difficult moment. And I also knew that there would be a beautiful benefit. I took a few more steps. By the time I got out of the rotunda, I felt lighter. I felt lighter. When we know him, when we understand him, and as we will study and look at him today, we're going to study how he dealt with pain. Because a lot of brothers who messaged me, they said, I don't know what to do right now. Hadi just passed. It doesn't, it's not registering. When I texted my man, Eamon, he's, I was like, I just saw him Wednesday. He said, like, I just saw him at Juma. I just saw him at Juma. So how do we grieve? How do we deal with pain? You could go on YouTube and type it in. Guaranteed million views, how to grieve. Or you can do something else. You can learn from the Prophet How did he grieve? So that not only will you get a method, but you will get one approved by God and get reward for following it. What does he say? Uh, Ibn Qayyim al Jozi, he tells us there's no way to know what's good and what's bad in detail, meaning what will bring God's pleasure, except at the feet, at the hands of the prophets. Peace and blessings be upon him. Brothers and sisters, I wanted to start tonight with the beginning years of the Prophet, so that we could see what formed him, what made him. I wanted to look at his early years as a young man, what made him who he was, and lessons we could take from that. But tonight, as I said, we lost someone close to us. And therefore, we have to look at how he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, grieved. How he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dealt with pain. I want to start with a verse of the Quran. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went through multiple stages and moments of huzn or grief in his life. And if we study his life, we'll find every reason for him to be very upset at the world and very upset at Allah. Let's begin with the earliest loss. And I, sell, I say this to you because despite how dark it is, when you connect to Muhammad Wasallam, there's a light that comes. He, his first loss was who? His father. Before he even knew who he was. Father is gone. Okay, fine, I don't really know him though. Time goes on, he's with his, his mother. And at the young age of five or six, I mean, five or six, you remember stuff. 
he loses his mother. Goes to his grandfather, because it takes a village. Goes to his grandfather. Grandfather loves him. He wasn't an absentee grandfather. He was there for him because he knew that this boy lost so much, which tells me and you, as you have friends and relatives that have lost a lot, you got to be there for them. You got to be there. So we all know what happens after a short time. Abdul Muttalib passes away as well. In this moment, now the Prophet ﷺ has lost two close people, but three in total. At this moment, next, he goes to his uncle, who's with him for some time. And the next big moment, actually, is after Revelation has begun. And we're going to talk a bit about Revelation tonight, because there's a lot we can gain from that. But in this moment, something happens. Eighth, ninth year, right after this boycott, two people pass away. Abu Talib, who was his rock outside the house, and Khadijah was his rock inside the house. It broke him. When she passed away, it broke him. The narrations tell us that the Prophet ﷺ, when she passed away, the narration says that قَلَّ خُرُوج that Hazina Rasul, he, he, he was deeply pained by her death. وَلَّزِمَ bait. This is something many people don't know. For quite a few days, he didn't even go out the house. He stayed home because he was processing. He was processing this loss. How did he cry? A lot of us cried over these, have been and are crying. How did the Prophet ﷺ cry? The scholars say there are five reasons why the Prophet cried in his life, ﷺ. I want you to know him. I want you to love him. I want you to relish in knowing who he was. I want you to dream about him tonight. He cried for five reasons. He, sallallahu alayhi wa cried when he prayed at night and no one was around. He cried when listening to the Quran. Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Mas'ud one day says, I was sitting and the Prophet came up to me. Can you imagine this moment? The Prophet ﷺ came up to me and he said, can you read Quran to me? You ever talk about nervous. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ, he said, uh, uh, Ibn Mas'ud says, alayka tanzil wa ana aqra alayk. It reveals on you and you want me to read it to you? He says, I want to hear it right now though. I want to hear it. See, he's always giving it. But he wants to hear it. He wants to feel it. So he begins to read, See, when you got clutch people in the gathering like that. Uh, he starts to read Surah Al Nisa. And Ibn Mas'ud is like killing it. And he's in it, feeling it. And then he says, I get to this verse that says, how will it be when we bring you on the day of judgment as a witness and we bring those as a witness as well? He says, I opened my eyes and the prophet was weeping. And he said, stop, stop. I can't take it. I can't take no more. Third reason, he cried out of the awe of God. There were moments where he was just in the reverence and awe of God that he would shed tears. And number four, he cried for his ummah, me and you. There's a hadith that I love, and I'm going to share with you guys. Sometimes we feel like, I wish I could have been back there. Man, if it was Uhud, if I was at Uhud, <laughs> you know, you wish you were there. The scholars, they say, there's a reason why Allah put you where you're at. Don't wish you were there. You might have been rolling with Abu Jahl. Now, that's what they say. Don't wish to be in another time. You don't know how you would have been then. But I have something I want to share with you where the Prophet, وسلم, for those who wish to have been with him, the Rasul, وسلم, in one narration, Abu Huraira, 
he says that the Prophet, peace and blessings, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, min ashaddi ummati li hubban. Part of my ummah who will love me the most. Nasun yakununa ba'di. There are people that will come later. They will wish, oh, we wish we saw the Prophet. I give anything to see him. I give anything to see him. So the, well, I'm sharing this for you because we weren't there, but he himself said to us, don't worry. He told his Sahaba, one narration, my favorite. He says, I wish I could see my brothers. The Sahaba were there. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we're here. I'm right here. <laughs> like, right? <laughs> And the Prophet وسلم, he says, La antum ashabi. My brothers, my brothers are those who will come after me. They haven't seen me, but they will wish they saw me and they would sacrifice anything to see me. He said, We're his brothers and sisters. The purpose of this is to know him. And when he, he also, the fifth reason the scholars say that he cried was when he lost someone. And he lost a lot of people, and that's what we're talking about. He lost his granddaughter. Her name was Umama. She was the daughter of Zainab. The narration says that Osama bin Zaid. Now, Osama bin Zaid was the son of Zaid bin Haritha. Zaid bin Haritha was his adopted son, the Prophet's adopted son. Like, that's like his boy. Osama says, one of the daughters of the Prophet, وسلم, her daughter was passing away. So she sent uh, someone to go get the Prophet. And in that moment, when he heard the news that the baby was passing, he's a grandfather. His grandchild is passing. He says, Inna lillahi ma akhada. Look at this moment. Look how he's grieving. He says, Inna lillahi ma akhada. To Allah belongs what he took back. Walahu ma a'ta. And for him is what he gave. He gave you that child. You benefited from the child. You enjoyed the child. You played with the child. But we all, this is what he said, but we all have a specified time. He sent this to his daughter. This was his advice to his daughter. He says, but tell her, be patient and expect reward from God. Be patient and know you're being rewarded. The person went and they came back and they said, Ya Rasulullah, Zainab is saying, come right now. Umama's passing away right now. Come. The Prophet stood up. The Sahaba come with him. Mu'ad bin Jabal, Ubay bin Kaab, they all come with him. The Prophet walked into the house and he said, give me the child. And he held the baby in his hand. An image that we're all seeing way too much now, right? He held the baby in his hand. And the, and the narration says, وَنَفْسُهَا تَقَعْقَعَ like the, her soul was just leaving. like She's gasping for air. And as the Prophet وسلم, holds her, he begins to cry. He begins to cry. He begins to weep. Sa'ad bin Ubadah, there was a brother who asked me, like, as Muslim men, how do we understand our emotions? And how we do it is we get off the internet we get off YouTube and we connect to the prophetic model. The prophet wept in moments of pain. But when it was time to be brave, he was the bravest, bravest of them all. In this moment, his heart is breaking because he's holding his grandchild. And he's amongst a, a society that don't show love to children, especially the men. So Saad bin Ubadah, he says, he says, Atabaki? Are you crying? He was shocked. 
For me and you were like, like, of course. La, for these men, it was like, wow, I've never seen emotion expressed like that from you. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, this is mercy. إِنَّمَا يَرْحَمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الرُّحَمَا If we have mercy, if we have compassion, if we have gentleness, if you were at Hadi's grave and you were crying, there's nothing wrong. That is mercy coming out of you. If you're imagining him in this gathering where he was just with us, every halakha, my man would come dap me up after. Like, yo, you killed this shit. Oh, stop playing, man. Chill out. A beautiful soul, man. 21 year olds around the country, what are they doing? This man was in a majlis every week. Yasser Qadi, Omar Suleiman, Mufti Kamani, Monday night. Allahu Akbar. Anas ibn Malik, he says, but that wasn't that. The Prophet, وسلم, he didn't just lose a granddaughter, he lost his own son. Ibrahim, the son of Maria. The narration is, is, is brilliant, it shows him. The Prophet وسلم, went into the house of the, the wet nurse, the family that was taking care of his son, Ibrahim. The Prophet I want you to see him. When you start to imagine him and see him, that's when we'll see him in our dreams. The Prophet ﷺ, he went and he grabbed his son, who's only one and a half-ish. And he picks him up and he kisses him and he smells him. You know, children have that smell. The young one, he smells him. He came back a little later and at this point, Ibrahim's chest was... Moving heavy. And the Prophet Sallallahu eyes began to well up with tears and the tears began to come down. Abdurrahman bin Auf was a man in this society who wasn't used to seeing masculinity that was true, mas prophetic masculinity. So he said, Anta ya Rasulullah, you cry, O Prophet of Allah. He said, Ya bin Auf, innaha rahmah. This is mercy. And then he said words that I want us to understand in this moment. This is the prophetic balance. This is why we study him. He said, Abdurrahman, inna al-ayna tadma. The eye will cry. It will shed tears. You should let it flow. Alhamdulillah. Wal-qalb yahzan. And your heart will be pained. Wala naqulu illa ma yarda rabbana. But... Here's the balance. Here's the prophetic balance. You ready? But we only say what pleases God. Those deep thoughts, those satanic thoughts, why God did this to me, why this, those, those words, they never come out. The eyes cry, the heart hurts, but the tongue stays in control. That's the prophetic masculinity right there. That's the prophetic healthy way of expressing the difficulty we go through. And then he looked at his son, and he says, وَإِنَّا بِفَرَاقِكَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمِ لَمَحْزُونُونَ He says, oh Ibrahim, separating from you makes us deeply sad. Separating from you makes us deeply sad. How did he cry? What was it like when he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, cried? What was it like? Sheikh Yusuf Nabahani he wrote a beautiful book describing the Prophet Wasallam, And that's the objective of this class. I want you to see him. I want you to know him. He says, and I quote, As for his weeping, Wasallam, how did he cry? He says, it was similar in nature to his laughter, which is something we'll talk about on another day. What did he laugh like? How was that like? Not today. He says, it was neither loud sobbing. The Prophet ﷺ, when he cried, it wasn't this loud, loud sobbing with a raised voice, just as his laughter wasn't super loud. He laughed, but he kept it in control. We'll talk about that another day. Rather, when he would weep, his eyes would shed tears, 
and they would flow down his cheeks. And listen to this. They say, we could hear a sound in his chest. And they said, it sounded like a kettle that was boiling with water. Like, like y'all know how it is when you're deeply crying. And that chest is pounding and the breath is moving heavy. This is how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cried. That's what his cries were, tears were like. There was another moment where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost someone very close to him. But in order for you to truly appreciate the moment of loss, you have to experience the moments of life. One day, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was walking around the Kaaba. This is in the early days of Mecca. And Abu Jahl sees him. Abu Jahl is his enemy. He wants nothing more but to shame this man and stop the message. And the narration says that Abu Jahl came over to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and he began to just curse him, mock him in his face. Just picture this moment. The Prophet is standing there, and Abu Jahl is in his face mocking him. I mean, the anger that is in our hearts is rightly justified. The Prophet is quiet, and it's funny because he's quiet, but he's not soft, y'all. He's quiet, and if he needed and he was allowed by Allah to respond, we see when he responds. But Allah didn't give him permission. It's time to be quiet and take it. So he's quiet, not saying anything. The Prophet is sitting there. After some moments, Abu Jahl walks away. The Prophet is like, cool, another day in the life of a prophet. I dealt with it before, I'll deal with it again. After some time, Hamza radiallahu an comes back. Hamza is the uncle of the Prophet. He's the foster brother, the, 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 uh, the milk brother of the Prophet. They're, they're related so close. He's his uncle. Hamza comes back from hunting. Now Hamza is a man of men. Strong guy. Big guy, stature. He's walking back into Mecca. And there's these two women walking behind him. And one of them, just loud enough for Hamza to hear, is talking to the other sister. She's like, man, you should have saw what just happened to Muhammad. She's talking to her friend, but she knows what she's doing. You should have saw, man, that was horrible. Mm -mm -mm. And Hamza hears and he turns around and he goes, well, what are you talking about? She says, oh. You're asking me, oh, nothing. He goes, no, tell me what happened. And he says, uh, oh, well, your, your, your nephew was just sitting there and he was just praying and doing nothing. And Hamza uh, uh, Abu Jahl just comes over and started cursing at him in his face. It was horrible. In that moment, there was a level, uh, uh, some ghira is the word. His, his jealous rage for his own family, it just stirred up inside of him and Hamza takes his bow and he runs over to Abu Jahl. And it's violent, but it, I don't care. He takes his bow and he hits him in the head with it and he gives him a severe laceration on his head. But Abu Jahl is surrounded by his ilk, his, his people. So they all jump up to get Hamza. Hamza's big, but he can't take 10 of us. And in that moment, something happens. Abu Jahl, he says, chill out. I was wrong in this situation. He realizes. And then Hamza says something interesting. In that moment, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an, he says, you curse my nephew, I'm on his religion too. Just out of his rage, out of his anger. He just said that. Out of his love for Muhammad, his love for Muhammad sallallahu led him into Islam without him even knowing what he was doing. He goes, I'm on his religion too. And he walks away. Hamza radiallahu anh says, I went home and I said, oh my God, <laughs> what did I just do? See, to become a Muslim in that time, man, you got blacklisted. You were done. All your street cred, all your connections, done, finished. So he says, وَقَدَ سَاوَرَتْنِي الْوَسْوَاسِ الشَّيَاطِينَ I had so many whispers. This happens, and I want to stop because this happens when a person converts so much. 
The hardest time when shaitan comes the hardest is right after you convert. What did you do? What about this? What about that? What about this? It's hard. So he says, I'm thinking to myself, he says, these are his words. He says, You started following this man without religion? Man, I'd rather be dead. I don't know what to do. And then he does something. In this moment, Hamza radiallahu an, he says, you know what? Oh Allah, guide me to what's right. Anytime someone comes to me and says, I'm thinking about Islam, I don't come, yeah, you need to come Muslim. God. Ask Allah to guide you. I don't know. I don't, ask Allah. Say, oh Allah, if this is righteousness, is this is good, if this is the life of the people of Jannah, worshiping one Allah, following the Anbiya, becoming a, a part of a tradition that has gone for way back, if this is the way that will gain your salvation, oh Allah, guide me to it. He says, I went, I, I, I made this dua and I laid down. But then he says, I never had a, a, a night of less sleep than that night. I didn't know what to do. He says, I woke up in the morning. He says, I went straight to the Prophet. He says, Ya ibn Akhi, hey nephew. He's like, I'm in a tough situation. The Prophet's like, what's up? What happened? And he says, I'm in a situation, and someone like me, I can't be in between. I can't be agnostic. I either believe in it or I don't. So the Prophet ﷺ looks at him. He speaks to him. And this nur hits his heart. And by the time the Prophet's done, he says, Ashadu annaka sadiq. I believe you're true. I believe this is it. Wasurra, the Prophet got so happy. When your family becomes Muslim, y'all, when your family starts practicing the deen, you've been on your deen for so long, and you see your father start to practice the deen, your mother, oh man, there's nothing better than that. So, Because it's like people come, it's like they came with you. It's like they came with you. You made this journey, and there were people that some of us left on the other side, but then some people come too. So the Prophet ﷺ was so happy, Hamza became Muslim. In the battle of... Uh, Uhud, some years later, there's an incident that happened which gives us a detailed understanding of what the Prophet, peace and blessings, looked like when he had to deal with pain. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala an, he says, when the battle of Uhud was happening, faqada Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Hamza, the Prophet lost sight of Hamza. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa lost sight of him. So he says to the people, because the battle had ended, did anyone see Hamza? I mean, it's a battlefield, and I want you to connect your heart to his heart. In this moment, his uncle is missing, and he's like, did anyone see him? Where is he? The, it's easier to know he's dead than to not know. It's easier to know than not know. That not knowing, it kills you itself. So in this moment, the Prophet says, where's Hamza? Has anyone seen him? One man says, I saw him, I saw him. He was over there by that boulder over there. You see that big boulder? I saw him there and I heard him saying these words. These were his words as he was thinking. He said, Ana Asadullah. I am the lion. He was fighting. He's like, I am the lion of God and the lion of the prophet. Oh Allah, Abarau I, 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 I absolve myself from what these people are doing against the prophet. I absolve myself. And I absolve myself from those who are running away. He was fighting, and his last words were, I'm here for the Prophet. Wasallam. The Prophet Wasallam went over to that place that the man pointed to, and he found Hamza laying there. It says, and I want you to see it, it says, when he saw him, he fell on his knees in front of him. He jetha, fell on his knees, and he began to cry. But that's not it. When he saw what they did to his body because they mutilated him, it says, it says, Shahiqa, like he screeched. Like he gasped, a deep gasp when, they, when he actually saw what they did. Then he said, he said to the people, cover him, cover him, cover him. Safiya was the prophet's aunt. And she, radiallahu anh, was a, she was a, 
a strong woman. And she was the sister, older sister of Hamza. And she comes running to the battlefield. And as she's running, the prophet sees her from a distance. And he says to Zubair, the son of Safiya, Al-Imra'a, Imra'a, go get your mom, go get your mom. And Zubair comes and he tries to stop her. And the Hadith says she just trucks him. <laughs> she just runs him over. Get out of my way. Where's my brother at? And Zubair is laying on the ground as his mother just ran him over. And he, he, goes, he goes, the prophet said stop. And she stopped. She stopped. She stopped right there. And she said, I want to see him. And the pro he said, the prophet said, you shouldn't see him. He doesn't want you to remember him that way. He doesn't want you to remember him that way. So she had these two cloths. She said, here, take these cloths for him and cover him with these. And then she went back. The prophet cried deeply when he lost Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an. And this, these moments we see that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was a man who was afflicted with much loss of life in his life. And when he lost people, he did not become stoic to it. He did not become stoic. That is not the prophetic ideal, but yet he let it hurt. He controlled his tongue, but he let his heart grieve, and he let his eyes cry. This is how the prophet wept, and this is why he wept. I want to end tonight with one more narration, just so that we can get a deeper look at who he was. And it's a narration that many of you know, but bear with me, inshallah, we'll read through this narration. The Quran says, there indeed has come to you a prophet from yourselves, Azizun alayhi, he is deeply pained by your suffering. I want us to all understand, if you want to walk in his footsteps, the first quality you have to have is the ability to connect to other people's pain around you. Harisun alaykum, he desires good for you. Alaykum bil mu'minin ra'ufur rahim, and he is compassionate with the believers. I want to begin by highlighting a narration that tells us what he was like before Revelation. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, أول ما بدي به رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من الوحي الرؤية الصالحة في النوم Aisha here in this narration is teaching us how revelation started with the Prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him. From the first moment. So she says that the first thing that happened is that the Prophet وسلم, would begin to see dreams. He would see these dreams and the next day they would be clear as falaq as subha like as the, as the break of dawn, they were those same things that he saw in his dream. He would see a dream and the next night he sees the very same thing. The scholars, they say because he was about to experience something so great, Allah was opening and getting him ready. He was getting his heart ready for this, this, this great connection of the infinite to the finite. So instead of, you know, your mom come in the room and open and, and turn the light on for Fajr, Boom, turn the lights on. You're like, yo, what you doing? Right? Versus that dimmer light. <laughs> you know what I mean? That dimmer. I remember one time, y'all, I was like 10 years old. I was staying the night at my grandmother's house. I probably told y'all this. I was staying the night at my grandmother's house. We ain't have fudger back then. I, I wasn't Muslim, okay? <laughs> and uh, she was waking me up for breakfast. And I'm sleeping. And all I realize is, next thing I know is there's someone just rubbing my back. And I open my, my, my eyes and my grandma's there. And she's like, it's time to wake up. I'm like, my mama don't never wake me up like this. <laughs> From the room, she'd be like, Michael, get up. So, uh, they say that the reason the Prophet ﷺ was shown these dreams was to get him ready, to get him ready for this this connection with Allah that he was about to experience. So the narration says, she says, Aisha says, 
ثُمَّ حُبِّبَ إِلَيْهِ الْخَلَى Then after that, the next thing is he began to like solitude. This is a beautiful part in your spiritual development, and this is how you walk in his footsteps. He began to love solitude. Right before that, that spiritual opening begins, you'll find yourself like, like wanting more space between you and Allah. More space from people so you could be with Allah. Right? You, you, I, I need distance a little bit. And it's not, you know, it's balanced, but you need that space to grow spiritually. So right before revelation came, Aisha says, radiallahu anha, that he began to love solitude. And then she says, وَكَانَ يَخْلُو He used to go to Ghari Hira, this cave where if you sit in it, you could see right at the Kaaba from miles away, but you could see the Kaaba. And he would stay there and he would just worship Allah, but he didn't know how to worship. And you guys don't know what it's like to want to worship God, but not know how to. Just making up stuff. Just, make, just making up stuff, man. Alhamdulillah ladhi hadana. All praise to Allah who guided us to Islam. So she says that he would stay there for multiple nights. He would take food. And then when his food and stuff ran out, he would go back to Khadija. She would make his lunch again. And he would go back to this cave. And y'all know the story, but we're going to read it, right? Because there's barakah and there's blessings in this moment of his life. حَتَّى جَاءَهُ الْحَقْ One night he was in that cave and the truth came. فَجَاءَهُ الْمَلَكُ The angel, Gabriel, came to him. And he said to him, recite, read, iqra. And in that moment, the Prophet ﷺ, who was unlettered, he says, مَا أَنَا I, I, I don't know how to read. So the angel grabbed him and the angel hugged him. Hugged him tight. Some scholars say he hugged him to let him know you ain't dreaming. This is real, what's going on right now. You know they say, pinch me, right? So they hugged him to make him know this is real. And then he let me go and he said to me, read. But I said to him again, I don't know how to read. Which is a blessing because when you read what came from his tongue in the Quran and you know that he never read or studied, it's where did you get this from? Only from Allah. He hugged me again until I thought it would kill me. And then he let me go. And then he said, read a third time. And I said, I can't read. And he hugged me the third time. And when he let me go, this light that we celebrate began, y'all. You don't get it, y'all. You don't get it. You don't get it. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Ummi Ayman was weeping. She was crying. And somebody said, why are you crying? She said, I'm not crying because he died. I'm crying because we used to get revelation fresh and hot. It used to come. We used to get like, right? It used to come. Yasin. It used to come. And now that door is closed. Right now we're studying the moment that final revelation from God that all previous prophets spoke about. This is that moment in history that everyone predicted and told. Jesus said, there's coming after me, Ahmed, and he's going to get revelation. This is that moment. And so the angel says to him, Iqara bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Created human beings from a, a clot of blood. Iqara wa rabbuka al-akram. Read and indeed your Lord. Akram is most generous. What did he do? I want us to be like him and connect to his emotion. What did he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? Did he sit there and say, hmm, let me figure this out? No. Faraja'a <laughs> biha. He ran, heart shaking, yarjufu fu'aduhu, heart quivering. He's in fear. Fadakhala ala Khadija. He goes to his rock. I told you, Abu Talib was the rock outside. Khadija was the rock inside. He had drama with people trying to mess with him. Abu Talib said, I got you. He had difficulty processing what he's going through. Khadija said, I got you. This idea that it's prophetic masculinity, I'll handle everything. Bro, you need a counselor, bro. You better go see a therapist. <laughs> Brother, you better, you better go see somebody. You ain't supposed to handle all that yourself. 
So, so he runs inside and he says to her, Zamiluni, hold me, hold me, cover me, cover me. So she covers him. It says she covers him. She held him until his fear subsided. Notice how she didn't just right away, what happened, what happened, what happened? <laughs> she didn't right away. She held him, let him calm down. And then she said to him, what happened? And I want you to focus on this. He says to her, as we talk about uh, the prophetic way of dealing with our emotions, she, he says, I'm scared for myself. Vulnerability. He's able to say, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. To my brothers in this room, you better have a friend you could call that you could be like, yo, I'm scared, Habibi. Have someone that you could say those words to. Yo, bro, I'm scared. The relief you'll get by just saying it. But the relief you'll get by just saying, he said it. And don't do it because I'm saying, do it because he did it. He went to her arms and he said, I'm scared. Habibti, my, my beloved, what? I'm scared. The ironic thing is this is the relationship when most of us try to front the most. But he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was okay with being vulnerable in this moment. That's his sunnah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I'm scared. Now what did she do? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. She says, Kalla. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> you can do it how you want. Kalla means no way. Mm-mm. No. However you want to say it. She goes, Wallahi. Ma yugzik Allahu abadan. She looks him in the eyes and she says with the... She uses such strength. She says, no, Allah will never disgrace you, ever. And then she reminds him. She says, and this is what I want us to focus on. She says, you join the family ties, meaning you bring the family together. Are you that family member that, that, that brings cousins together, sisters and brothers together? Are you the family member that brings uncles together? Who ain't been talking for three months? Oh, you know, Uncle Bilal said, man, he misses you. He ain't even say it. <laughs> Uncle Ahmed, Uncle Bilal said he misses you, man. He's sorry. He ain't even say it either. Next thing they meet each other, thinking they each one of them apologize to the other one. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu said there's so much reward in doing that. Are you that? Because that's Muhammadan right there. Innaka la tasilur raham. You bring the family together. And I hate to be that, be that guy. But are you the one causing drama, splitting people up? You heard what she said. You heard what he said. And then what do you do? Khadija says, radiallahu anha, wa tahmilul kalla. Tahmilul kal means you take on hard things. You take on burdens. When people have stuff they're struggling with, you take it on. We'll wrap it up in a second. You earn for people that don't have anything. You take care of the guest and you help in all the right causes. You're at the rallies. You're at the protests. You help in the right causes. You're always in the side of truth. And in that moment, she says, okay, let's go. I'm going to take you to my uncle and we'll stop here. I want us to appreciate how he cried. I want you to appreciate that he had a year that was called the year of sadness because he lost close people. You'll have emotional ups and downs, but don't let the highs be too high and the lows be too lows. Be in the middle like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He cried, but his tears came. Heart hurt, but he always spoke the truth. May Allah allow us to walk in his footsteps. ورسائل المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم إن شاء الله. See everybody next week إن شاء الله تعالى. We're gonna make a special dua for Hadi right after salah إن شاء الله because the duas are accepted after salah. So after salah we'll make a special dua for our brother Hadi and his family. جزاكم الله خير. سلام عليكم.